are eight stores of energy. Kinetic energy, which is the energy of any moving object. Chemical energy, energy stored in a battery or energy in food. Electrostatic energy, due to attractive and repulsive forces between charges. Magnetic energy, elastic potential energy, when an object is stretched or squashed. Gravitational potential energy, when an object is at a height in a gravitational field. And nuclear energy. Finally, thermal energy. The next thing you need to know is how energy can be transferred from one store to another. It can be done mechanically by forces doing work electrically when there's a potential difference and charges are moving. Heating and radiation this is the law of conservation of energy. Let's look at an example. Now, imagine you have a candle. The candle uses chemical energy in wax and it's converted into heat and light. Now, if the amount of chemical energy is 100 joules and the heat energy is 60 joules, what is the amount of light energy? So the idea is energy cannot be created or destroyed. apply the law of conservation of energy. Think about a pendulum. Look at the example here and it says at the lowest position here the gravitational potential energy is zero because the height is zero. That is the bottom level and uh, the kinetic energy is 10 joules as it is moving fastest here. Now what's the kinetic energy at the very top? Because the pendulum will move like that and it will stop here before it turns back. Remember kinetic energy is all about movement. And if there's no movement, no kinetic energy. So that one is zero joules. However, the total amount of energy is 10.0. Add 10 is 10. So everything here is gravitational potential energy. Same thing here. GPE is 10 joules. Kinetic energy is zero joules. Now in a position like this, somewhere in the middle, if they say that GPE is three joules, what is the kinetic energy? Remember, the total must be 10 so the kinetic energy has to be 7 joules. So the point is the total energy is always 10 in this example. 10 and 0 is 10. 3 add 7 is 10. 0 add 10 is 10. 10 add 0 is 10. So at any point in this particular example, the total energy is the same. So energy is conserved. All right, the examiners love these energy equations. So let's go through them nice and easy. Here is the first one. Gravitational potential energy is found using the formula MGH. M is the mass in kilograms. G is the gravitational field strength, which is 10 newtons per kilogram on the Earth approximately. And this H here is the height in metres. Now, I remember some years ago, and I think probably 2015 or 16, one of the questions for one mark was, what does this lowercase g stand for? And you know what many students said. They said gravity. And unfortunately, that did not get them the mark. So please remember, this g here is gravitational field strength, which is always 10 newtons per kilogram on the Earth. Now here's an example. A person of mass 60 kilograms is on a ledge that is 120 centimetres above the ground level. What is the GPE of the person? So M is 60, G on the Earth is always 10, the value of H is 1.2. Now you need to be very careful here. Why did I put 1.2? Because it has to be in metres, so you need to divide centimetres by 100. So it's 1.2. So the answer here is 720 joules. Next one is kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is defined as the energy obtained by mass due to its movement. So if a mass of m is travelling at speed v, the kinetic energy is given by the formula half mv squared. Again, units are very important. Energy is always measured in joules. Half is a number. Mass is measured in kilograms. If they gave it in grams, you have to divide it by 1000 to do the conversion. And this v here is speed, and speed is measured in metres per second. So step one, the formula ke equals half mv squared. Now we need to substitute the values half times 1000 times 20 squared, which gives you 200,000 joules. Next one is elastic potential energy. This is defined as energy obtained by an object due to its shape. That is when it is stretched or squashed. Imagine you have a spring of spring constant k. 
Now the spring constant is a value which gives you an idea about how hard or easy to stretch it or squash it. Something with a high spring constant is hard to stretch. Now if you exert a force on it, it will extend. Now this extra length that it gains when you exert a force on it is called the extension. We normally use the letter X here. Sometimes we use E. They are both okay. Now, to find the elastic potential energy of a spring, we can use the formula EPE is equal to half FX. F is the force exerted. Now, there is another variation of this formula. That is EPE is equal to half KX squared. So you can see in the second one, we use K and X. So one might ask, why do we need two formulae? If you know F and X, you need to use the first one. If you know K and X, you can use the second one. Now let's look at an example. You have a spring of spring constant K, 200 newtons per meter, and you exert a force, and it extends by 10 centimeters. Find the amount of elastic potential energy. So we have EPE is equal to half FX, or EPE equals half KX squared. Now we can clearly see, I know K, I know X, so obviously it has to be the one with K and X, and not this one. We are going to use this one, so let's do that. EPE is equal to half times, K is 200 times X squared. Now this is really important, X is 10 centimetres, but it should be in metres. Divide by 100, 0 0.1 squared, and the answer is 1 joule. Now here's a quick summary of what we discussed. GPE is given by the formula MGH. Kinetic energy is given by the formula half mv squared. Elastic potential energy is given by one of these two formulae. EPE equals half fx or EPE equals half kx squared. The next thing you need to know is work done. Now in physics work is done when you exert a force and move something through a distance and we can use the formula work done is equal to force multiplied by distance moved in the direction of the force. Obviously work is the same as energy transferred measured in joules. Force is measured in newtons. The distance is measured in meters. Imagine you exert a force of 20 newtons and move an object through a distance of 60 centimeters. So what is the work done? The answer is 12 joules. The next subtopic is power. In physics, power is defined as the rate of doing work, or rate of energy transfer. So whenever we use the word rate, that means you divide by time. So we need to know these two formulae. Power is equal to work done, divided by time, or power is equal to energy divided by time. Efficiency is defined as the proportion of the input energy that is converted into useful forms. Think about a car, maybe a petrol car. So the amount of chemical energy input is 1000 joules. It gives out kinetic energy, thermal energy and sound energy. Now obviously thermal energy and sound energy are not useful. The only useful form here is kinetic energy. So to calculate efficiency, you need to use the following formula. Efficiency is useful output divided by the total input. Now what's the useful output? 600? Yeah. What's the total input? It's 1000. So the answer is 0.6 and you don't have any units because the units, joules, get cancelled out. Now in some instances they can ask you to calculate the percentage efficiency. Now this is really easy. To convert a fraction to a percentage you always multiply by 100. It's the same formula, you just have 100 at the end. So the answer is 600 divided by 1000 multiplied by 100 and the answer is 60%. So the percentage efficiency is 60%. Efficiency itself is 0.6. Here is a really important thing you need to memorise, efficiency can never be more than one. The definition of specific heat capacity is the amount of energy needed to raise the temperature of one kilogram of a substance by one degree Celsius. The specific heat capacity of water is 4200 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. Here is the formula for specific heat capacity. E is the amount of energy measured in joules. M is the mass in kilograms. C is the specific heat capacity in joules per kilogram. Delta theta is the change in temperature in degrees Celsius. This whole thing is together and it stands for the change in temperature. Find the amount of energy needed to heat 200 grams of water from 23 to 83 degrees Celsius. So step one, write the formula. Now let's substitute values. M is the mass. I should put 0 0.2. 
Why 0 0.2? Because it's in kilograms, and here it's given in grams. So 200 divided by 1000 is 0 0.2 times specific heat. Capacity C of water, 4200 multiplied by delta theta. Delta theta is the change in temperature, so it goes from 23 to 83. So let's find the difference. All I need to do is 83 take away 23, and it's 50,400 joules. The aim of this experiment is to determine the specific heat capacity of aluminium. Insert the immersion heater into the larger hole at the top of the metal block. So here's the heater which heats up. To measure the temperature, we need a thermometer. So you insert a thermometer and you add few drops of oil to ensure good thermal contact. Now the idea is, if you look at it closely, the bulb of the thermometer will be like this. Now the hole is a bit larger than that. So there is no good thermal contact, as it's usually filled with air. Now air is a poor conductor, so what we do is add a couple of drops of oil to make sure that this space gets filled up. Now we need to use cotton wool to lag it measure and record the starting temperature of the block. So that's the first thermometer reading. Then you turn the power supply on and then let it go for a certain period of time, say 10 minutes. Now during this time you need to get the readings from the ammeter and the voltmeter. There will be an ammeter and voltmeter connected. Then you turn the heater off and you wait for the thermometer to reach the highest rating. Remember even after the heat is turned off the temperature can still rise. So you need to watch for the maximum temperature so the thermometer will go up to a maximum value and start to drop and you record that maximum value. Let's say the mass of the metal block is 2 kilograms. Initial temperature was 20. Final temperature maximum was 32. Current and voltmeter readings are given and the heat was on for 600 seconds. Now remember, my intention is to find specific heat capacity C. E is equal to MC delta theta and this energy is supplied by the electrical supply so for electrical energy, E is equal to VIT. Now let's substitute the values. Here the energy supplied is 12 volts multiplied by 2 amps multiplied by 600 seconds. Now I can substitute this 14,400 for energy. Here 14,400 is equal to M times C times delta theta. For change in temperature, 32 take away 20 is 12. You can do the calculation and the value of C can be calculated. The next thing you need to know is about reducing unwanted energy transfers from buildings. Now for this, you need to know the methods that we use to reduce it. For an example, the energy lost through the walls can be reduced by using cavity wall insulation. So basically you have the two layers of brick and we have some foam in the middle. Here's one layer, here's the other layer and the gap in the middle is filled with a type of foam to reduce energy loss. Hot water tank jackets are used to insulate hot water tanks to reduce energy loss. The pipes that are used for carrying hot water, the copper pipes, are covered by foam. We call it pipe lagging. Double glazing, you have two panes of glass and then low pressure air in the middle to reduce the energy loss. Draft excluders, you can see them in the post boxes or sometimes under the doors, under the doors of buses. And then for the roof, we use loft insulation. Energy resources can be divided into two main groups as renewable and non-renewable resources. As the name implies, renewable resources are the ones that do not run out. Non-renewable energy resources are the ones that cannot be replaced quick enough and they will eventually run out. For an example, coal, oil, gas and nuclear energy resources, wind energy, wind turbines, solar energy, which can be used for electricity production and also solar heating biofuel. So these are the biological substances, like the things that you get from trees that can be used to as a fuel. For example, used cooking oil can be converted into biodiesel. Um, things Ethanol is an example of another biofuel. Wave energy, tidal energy. Now these two, sometimes students get them a bit mixed up. They are actually slightly different. In wave energy, we use the energy of the moving waves to produce electricity. In tidal energy, it is the high tide and low tide. So when the sea level goes up in high tide, you capture the water using tidal barrages, and when the other side goes down, you release that energy, and we can convert that gravitational potential energy of the water at the high level into kinetic energy, which is converted into electrical energy. Coal, oil and gas. Collectively, we call them fossil fuels. Now these are the non-renewable ones, coal, oil, gas and nuclear hydroelectricity. We use gravitational potential 
energy of water at a high level and geothermal energy is the energy that we get from the heat inside the Earth's surface. So basically radioactivity of the rocks produce heat energy. We use that heat energy to heat water which is then turned into steam and we can use that steam to drive a turbine. Advantages and disadvantages of different energy sources is another popular exam question. Solar power is renewable and it's sustainable. That means it will not run out. It has low maintenance once installed. Ideal for small scale setups like road signs. Because you don't need to have wiring to connect to the national grid. You can have it anywhere you want, can be built into roofs or walls. You can sort of integrate it. It has a minimal visual impact, no fuel cost, no air pollution during operation, like no carbon dioxide. Now remember, in the exam, don't just say no pollution, which is not specific enough. It's kind of vague. You need to say that something does not produce greenhouse gases like CO2. Be very specific. Disadvantages. High initial cost. Not reliable. Depends on the sun and requires a large area due to low efficiency. Wind power. It's renewable, low maintenance cost, and no fuel cost. No CO2. Cons are visual pollution and noise pollution. Also, it's not reliable. Depends on the wind and limited possible locations. You can't use it from in any place you like. Usually, the ideal locations for these are the most expensive land, like the ones in the seashore. They can harm birds due to spinning turbine blades. Unfortunately, sometimes we can find dead birds under wind turbines. Wave power. Renewable, sustainable, no fuel cost, no carbon dioxide or any other atmospheric pollutants. Disadvantages. It's difficult to transfer energy from the sea to where you need it. Probably to a far place in the land. It's unreliable. Depends on the wave conditions. Limited suitable locations for installation. Can disrupt marine ecosystems because it can be harmful to fish, corals and other sea life. Tidal energy. Renewable. No fuel cost. No CO2. It can help to regulate the estuary water levels and it's more reliable than other renewable energy because there is a pattern. Disadvantages can have a large impact on ecosystems. It does not always generate power when it's most needed because you can't really change when you get the most of the energy and there are few of few suitable locations for installation. You might need to actually quickly pause this video for these things because I'm kind of quickly talking this through. So to absorb it, you might need to pause the video have a look and then press play. Hydroelectricity, um, renewable, no fuel cost, no atmospheric pollutant like carbon dioxide. It can create lakes for recreation, which is a positive thing. It's generally reliable. Disadvantages can have a major impact on ecosystems because you're flooding large areas, limited locations. These are often built far from cities. So we have to transfer energy. Um, there's a transfer issue, which means there will be loss of energy, risk of flooding when you build the dam. Fossil fuels. Generate a large amount of energy at low cost. So it's energy dense, reliable. It's not affected by weather. You can use it whenever you want it. Existing infrastructure. Many power stations have already been built, so you don't need to spend money to make new ones. And it's relatively safe to transport in comparison to things like nuclear power for example. Disadvantages, it releases carbon dioxide which is a greenhouse gas, causes global warming, climate change, burning coal and oil, produces SO2 which causes acid rain and it's non-renewable. And finally, nuclear power do not release air pollutants like CO2. They are very efficient, very energy dense and is reliable. Disadvantages, they produce radioactive waste which is dangerous, costly to manage. And also they can remain in the environment for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Risk of nuclear accidents like Chernobyl, high startup and shutdown cost. So the startup cost of a nuclear power station is pretty high. And also at the end of the life of this nuclear power station, the decommissioning is also a very costly process. Here is a mini quiz to check your understanding on the energy topic. We are done with the topic now. Please pause the video and give these a try. When you are ready for the answers, press play. Here are the correct answers. Please take a minute to check your answers and if you have any doubts or uh, questions regarding this you can always ask me in the comment section and I will try and answer.